Jeff, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure having you on the show. If you wouldn't mind to our audience to give a brief introduction of who you are, what you've been up to, that'd be great. Sure, I'm happy to. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm Jeff Hyman, uh, based in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, I have been in recruiting my entire career. So that is my passion, helping growth stage companies scale by making sure that they put a top performer, what I call a rock star, in every seat of their company. And I do that a bunch of different ways, both teaching companies how to do it and doing it for them. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about your book? So I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Recruit Rockstars, and it went on to become a bestseller. So I was very fortunate that it really resonated with people. I think that's because it's so hard for many leaders to attract and land and keep uh, top performers in their companies. And so I uh, just wrote a book about all the mistakes that I had seen people make, including me, over the years. And, uh, and there were 10 of them, and I kind of outlined, okay, what do most people do? And then what is the best way to actually approach that situation? And it's really resonated with people. So developed an online course about it and, and teach at a number of schools, and people have uh, really responded to it. Can, you, uh, can we dive a little deeper on the actual content? You mentioned 10 mistakes or best practices. Can we talk about them? So which ones are the biggest mistakes that companies make when it comes to recruiting? Yeah, it's kind of like trying to choose your favorite child, right? <laughs> They're all, I, you know, when I interview companies and I meet with folks and I, I have a podcast and, uh, you know, I usually find they make three or four or five of these 10 mistakes. But probably the most common, if I had to pick one, is not knowing what you're looking for to begin with. And it is so hard to find it and spot it and land that person if you don't first get very clear on what it is you're looking for. And I do that by laying out a scorecard and I show people how to do it and I teach this technique. It's super simple, but most companies just don't have the discipline or they're so behind the eight ball, they're in such a rush to start recruiting that they don't take the time. And it only takes 30 minutes to sit down and map out, okay, what am I looking for? So that's a very common one. And uh, one that's been coming up with uh, my discussions with uh, business owners and in my own business as well, is that sometimes you hire for the silver bullet. Is that something you've noticed as well that you haven't figured out how to solve a problem and you think somebody else can do that for you? Absolutely. So uh, that is a very common shortcut that leaders wanna take. I don't know how to do something. So I'm gonna find a person that's done it and bring them to my organization. now. There's nothing wrong with that logic, right? If you found the right person and if they match your company's DNA, which is a whole nother topic, and if your situation matches very closely the one they were in, then that's a reasonable plan. The problem is there aren't many people like that. If you can even find them and if you can even afford them and if they match your company's DNA, you might get lucky. But luck is not a strategy. So when it comes to hiring, you're far better off finding someone who has the, what I call the cognitive ability to think through a problem, reason through it, break it down to its parts, figure out what data do I need, ask the right questions, formulate a hypothesis, test and iterate solutions. That's something not everyone can do, but many more people can do it versus just that perfect silver bullet. So if you recruit and attract people who can have that cognitive ability to, to dissect problems, because that's all scaling a business is, is a bunch of problems, right? Um, and when you find those people, they can help you scale much further, much faster. You recruit for these people. Well, it's a never ending process. Um, what you don't do is start recruiting just at the time that you need it. You really need to dig your well before you're thirsty. So just as all of us as individual candidates should always build our network to think about our career long-term, you don't just start looking for a job when you're desperate. Same thing in hiring. You should always be recruiting, ABR, always be recruiting. It's just like selling, right? Always meeting to expand your network, meet candidates who are talented that potentially you could bring to your organization. And if you can't make room for them now, perhaps in three months or a year or beyond. And uh, going back to the book a little bit more, can you tell me about the structure of the book and maybe some of the key lessons from it? So the book quite simply lays out these 10 challenges, these 10 mistakes. And most people that read the book, they email me and they're like, oh my God, I identify with this. I make seven of these mistakes all the time. Um, and then the book dissects why those are mistakes, not just my opinion, but some of the data behind it. And I give examples. And then we talk about, okay, what should you do differently? So here's a good example, a very common example. So let's say you're hiring uh, a VP of marketing, right? 
the, the common mistake would be, well, I'm going to go out and find a VP of marketing who makes the same amount that I can afford to pay. The problem with that logic, while it seems to make sense, is why would that person make the move? It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? They're already making the same money. They've got the same title. They've got the same scope of responsibilities. There's not a lot of reason for them to come. And so when you pursue that strategy, what you find quite often is you wound up recruiting a B player, which of course you don't find out until it's too late. What is typically a better strategy is to look one level down and bring up a top performer who's earning uh, 20% less. I find that to be a great number. Uh, then you can afford to pay. Maybe it's a senior director of marketing who's effectively doing the role. They just haven't gotten tapped on the shoulder. They haven't gotten the recognition. Maybe they're trapped under a VP of marketing who's not going anywhere, but they are so ready. Now it's, it's harder, right? You have to do more homework. You have to do more assessment of the candidate. You have to spend more time understanding their skills. It's not as simple as looking at a piece of paper and saying, well, they checked the box. They're a VP of marketing. I see that mistake every day of the week. And it's just a, a very foolish strategy to limit yourself to just those candidates. You open it up to a much broader set of candidates who quite often will do better if you bring them up, say, from the minor leagues to the major leagues. That's a great example. Is there another example or a key lesson that you can share like this one? Yeah, uh, this is a very simple one. Uh, money, right? You should, you should never be losing candidates over money. And the reason that happens all the time is people don't talk money till the end of the process. Then they make an offer only to find out the candidate is making 30,000 more than you can afford to pay. So I short circuit that by bringing up compensation on the very first screening call with a candidate. And people will say, oh, I'm uncomfortable doing that. Is that rude? And I find candidates are very receptive to it. Now, of course you bring it up in a tactful and legal way, but candidates don't wanna waste their time any more than you do when it comes to going through this whole process only to find out that there's a disconnect on money. So I bring up comp on the first call and I almost never lose candidates uh, over money. I lose candidates over other things, but not money. And so that's a very tactical way to save a ton of time that you might waste on someone who you could never afford to begin with. What's the right way to uh, bring up comp in the first conversation? Is it asking what are your expectations? Because uh, there will be some pushback. They don't want to give a number first. So how do you approach that? Sure, sure. I, I am consistently surprised by how many candidates will just tell you their compensation. I, I don't know if I would recommend that to a job seeker, but I take uh, the hiring point of view. So if a candidate's willing to share, I see it as very candid, full disclosure. My job is to make a match, right? Think of yourself as a matchmaker, a recruiter, and you're not looking to steal or lowball a candidate. That's not at all what I recommend. I'm looking to pay top dollar for a top performer, as long as I can afford them. We all have a budget. So why not start with your best and final and ask the candidate very tactfully. I, I say, look, uh, I don't want to waste your time. If we're in a situation where we're, we're so far apart, would it be okay if we talk about compensation? And 95 to 98% of the time, the answer to that question is, of course, let's talk compensation. I'm then silent on the phone. It's kind of creepy. And as you know, uh, you know, people are uncomfortable with silence. They will fill that silence. Quite often, the candidate will say, well, I earn uh, uh, you know, $125,000. And now I'm, I'm not looking to turn it into a negotiation. I just want to know, are we in the ballpark, right? If they say I'm I make 125 and I can only afford to pay 90. I'm probably going to say, look, the reality is you could do this job in your sleep, but we can't afford you. And I'll then turn the conversation to a sourcing conversation and ask them, who do you know, or who have you worked with? That's probably more at the 90 to hundred range who you think would be interested and candidates are happy to introduce you to, the, to their, to their friends. So I do that quite often. That's great. Thank you very much for sharing such a very, tactical and uh, applicable uh, insights. Um, I want to go to the quick fire section where uh, I'd love to hear from you. What's your second favorite business book, assuming the first one is your own? Actually, that's a good question. My, my book is not my favorite. I, I am a, a voracious reader, uh, especially of business books. And I've been very lucky uh, to actually interview for my podcast some of my idols. Uh, Tom Peters is one and, you know, he's just written so many phenomenal books and he's still alive and lives in Vermont. I had him on my podcast recently and I went back 
in preparation for the podcast episode and re you know reread some of his stuff and it's just brilliant um, because it's just such a a a hit in the gut as to how many business leaders lose touch with the consumer and with their employees. Um, he was one of the first uh, real vocal business leaders about the importance of diversity and half of your team being women, which I'm proud to say has always been the case in my companies. Um, so I would put Tom Peters probably top of the list. Uh, more recently, you know, there's a great book called The First 90 Days, which was written by a top professor. Uh, and and it's it's all about how to uh, onboard yourself to a new company. You know, so many companies are bad at onboarding. You can't wait for your company to do it. You need to do it yourself and develop a plan as you enter your new role as to how you're going to go about it. So the first 90 days is, is a classic that I, I've read dozens of times. And what do you wish you knew when you were 20? <laughs> when I was 20, um, I wish I knew how easy it is to fritter away hours and days and weeks and months of your life, right? When you get to my age, over 50, and each of these gray hairs is very well earned, you really start to feel not your mortality, that's kind of cliche, but how you can always create more resources and money and other things, you can't create more time. And when you're in your 20s and 30s, you don't quite realize that. You'll spend years on a startup concept that you should have given up long ago. It's just never going to make it because you're not getting traction. And it, the reason you don't give up on it, aside from being stubborn and being an idealist, is you're not tracking the right metrics and you don't see that this is not progressing. You're tracking these vanity fake metrics that make you feel like the business has potential. And so in some of my early startups, I've started you know, a handful of companies I definitely waited too long to make pivots or decisions or just move on entirely. So I wish I had known that. Awesome. Thank you very much for sharing. Thanks a lot, Jeff. That was great. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.